Good evening. Please open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 14. And we're going to be reading verses 1 through to 21. Matthew chapter 14, starting at verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus. And he said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because they considered him a prophet. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for them and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted, and he had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl, who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about five thousand men, besides women and children. This is God's word. It is uh, so lovely to be here, so thank you, Ian, for the invitation. Let me pray. Father God, I pray that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth might be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. One of my favourite all-time stories, you've probably heard it actually, it's from uh, John Dixon's book Humilitas, and and he speaks of a scene in 1930s Detroit where some young kids jump on a bus and they see an African-American guy sitting at the rear of the bus. So they, they, they saw their strength in numbers and they started insulting this guy. And this guy just sat placidly where he was and didn't respond. So they moved further up the bus and up the ante a bit and called him more names. Uh, and eventually the guy stood up. And as he stood up, they stood back because the guy was a lot bigger than he looked from the seated position. And uh, he started walking towards them and they started to move out of his way. And as he got close, he simply pulled out a business card, handed it to them and went on his way. Now, apparently that business card read, Joe Lewis heavyweight boxing champion of the world. (laughs) Joe Lewis went on to be uh, the heavyweight champion of the world for 12 years. Muhammad Ali said about him, I used to say that I was the greatest, but Joe Lewis was the greatest. Here they were standing in the presence of this amazing boxer and they they didn't even know. And he had revealed his, his identity with this business card. Now, when you come to the gospel of Matthew. It's all about the slow revelation of Jesus the King. It starts in Matthew 1 verse 1 where it describes 
the gospel as the biblos genusos, the, the beginning of the good news, the, the, the new creation that is coming in Jesus Christ, who is the son of David, the son of Abraham. Then in chapters four, 1 through 4, we get an amazing introduction to this king that is coming, all the extraordinary things around his birth, the prophecies, uh, sometimes the strange events, things like the Magi, uh, all these amazing things that point to the amazing identity of this child who's coming into the world. Then from chapters 4 through to chapter 16, there's this, this section Matthew France causes Jesus the Messiah revealed to us in word and deed. So you get all these, these great sections of teaching and Jesus' miracles. And then you come to this chapter uh, in Matthew chapter 14, where you have another major step in the revelation of Jesus as king. And uh, it, it uses uh, this, this style of, I guess we'd call it juxtaposition. You know, your English teacher used to talk about putting two stories next to each other and you, you get that assignment to compare and contrast. Did you ever get that assignment? Well, well, I don't know if you've noticed that these stories are very different, but they're two stories about banquets, right? They're two stories about hosts of the banquets. Uh, there's the two stories that depict very different ways of participating in the banquet and those in the scene have very different roles. And if you like, we're presented with a picture of Herod's ambition or Jesus and his kingdom. And we're meant to gaze into these two stories and, and, and seek to see, at least in Herod, am I anything like this man? Like, is my life about building my kingdom? And where does that end up? And then there's a look at, at Jesus and and his role as host, what he is like in comparison, what his banquet is like, what he asks his followers to do. And we're asked to kind of choose a way. What will it be, Herod's ambition, or Jesus and his kingdom and his mission? So for, uh, chapter 14, verses 1 to 12, is all about the Herod story. And it begins in verse 1 by saying, at that time... Herod the Tetrarch. Now, this is Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was a king. Uh, Herod Antipas wanted to be a king. He petitioned Caesar to be called a king, but he was never given the title. He was al always known as Herod the Tetrarch. Now, it w the, the title king was given to him by those who feared him because he was a cruel man. But it was often ironic. It was often a put down. Everyone knew that this was a point of humiliation and it irked him. And it's just a wee picture of the ambition of this man. Then in the next verse, verse 2, it says, This Herod heard the reports about Jesus and said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work within him. So here you have this powerful man, and he has this belief that a Hebrew prophet has come back from the dead. That's an extraordinary belief for this kind of man to have. Why would someone come to that conclusion? Well, as we read on the story, we start to find out perhaps why he would believe something like that. And it comes via almost a flashback in the text in verse 3. It says, Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. Again, it's helpful to know some of the history here. See, Herod was a man, we know, of great ambition. And he, actually, his first marriage was a marriage of cementing a political alliance with ne the Nabatians who were next door. He married the king of Nabatians' uh, daughter so that he could secure the safety of his own power, right? So he would do anything to gain power. Now we get this second glimpse of him 
is he's a man who also is someone filled with lust. So he goes to visit, to visit his half-brother, Philip, and while he's there, he falls in love with his wife and takes her, right? Now, this is fascinating because his lust for power will come against his lust because what will happen when he cheats on his wife, eventually the nobations will rise up and destroy Herod, right? But here's this picture of a man who's not just choosing between what God wants and he wants. He's choosing between what God wants and he wants and what he wants and he wants. Does that make sense? Like, he's a man whose own desires are eating him up and chewing him up. He's a man of self-sabotage. But the story goes on and we learn more about him. In walks John. So John confronts Herod about his sin. And uh, we get this strange response from Herod because it says in Mark 6 verse 20 that Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. And when Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. So there's this weird thing that John stepped into Herod's pathway and he confronted him because of his sin. And something in Herod liked what he heard or was, he was pulled towards what he heard, even though that it was this really tough message. Perhaps it was because John the Baptist was the very opposite of Herod. So you learn in, uh, in Matthew chapter 3 that John came preaching this amazing message and he, was, he, he lived in the wilderness. You know, he wore camel skins and a leather belt. He ate locusts with honey, very different from Herod's diet, I'm guessing. We don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure Herod didn't enjoy locusts, right? And then he had this message that he brought. You know, if you have uh, some food, you should share it. If you have two shirts, give one away. If you're a soldier, be content with your pay. If you're a tax collector, don't extort people. So he came with this message that was very different to the way that Herod lived. So at the same time that he was attracted to this message, Herod was repelled by it. You know, even though something pulled him in, and at moments, I, I think he almost felt remorse for who he was and who was, he was becoming. He also wanted to shoot the messenger. He also wanted to silence this message. It says in uh, Matthew 5 verse 7, Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because he considered John a prophet. So he put John in limbo in prison. Now as the story moves on, this story comes to a head. Uh, Matthew, uh, Mark's version of the story says in Mark 6, 21, that Herod uh, threw a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. So he decides to throw himself a birthday party. And again, it's a party to cement power. So he vi invites the high officials, the military commanders and, and leading men of Galilee, the power elite. He invites them all to this party. Now, it said he, he had it at his fortress, and this fortress in Machaerus was apparently amazing. It was on the outskirts of Her Herodian territory. It was said to have underground heating. Uh, the wine would have been flowing. The food was undoubtedly wonderful, and the occasion was probably glittering with opulence. So you have this party in this extraordinary place, this extraordinary food, with all this abundance, they've had too much to drink, and, and what happens next in the party is just, it's flabbergasting. In verses, uh, verses uh, 6 to 8, it says, on, on Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for them and pleads so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asks. So there's all these drunk men at a party. So what do you do? You ask your stepdaughter to come and dance for them. And then, and then you make this outrageous promise that you're prepared to give up up to half your kingdom 
because it pleased those that departed so much. Now again we get a glimpse of Herod and perhaps remorse. It says here that King was distressed or he was grieved. Again we get this fleeting vision of perhaps conscience. Uh, this fleeting sense that the Herod is looking over the cliff into the moral abyss that was his own life and, and pausing before jumping in. But then it comes and it goes. Like remorse never becomes repentance. He feels bad, but he never changes, right? And then it says this, he has this incredibly distorted sense of honour. But because of his oaths and his dinner guests, He'd ordered that her request be granted, and John had him uh, beheaded in prison. And John was beheaded in prison. So here we have this beautiful, opulent setting, glittering with wealth, impressing powerful people. The wine is flowing, and suddenly there's a human head on a plate. What a terrible story. What a terrible story. And even the way he engages others in the story. So an attendant and executioners have to become complicit in this evil act of killing a God-honouring man. And then this awful act of the attendant brings it in and hands it to the 13, 14-year-old girl. You know, how does this happen? And you get this, this kind of echoing, I can almost hear Jesus' words in the background saying, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? See, he has everything, power, opulence, wealth, food, wine. And I bet you the next day when they woke up with their hangovers and thought back on the events of the night before, they must have felt so empty. They must have felt alone. They were still looking over their shoulder. They must have wondered, how did we ever get to this place? Now, we might never end up in a place where a head is brought in on a platter. But we have this funny idea in our culture that to find your truest identity, it's a, I guess it's a Disney thing, really. You dig deep down into the kind of depths of your life and you, you, you pull away all the rubbish and constraints of society and you pull out this pure identity that you're kind of to live out. But the Bible story is different. It tells us that as you dig down to the bottom, what you'll actually find is these, these broken image bearers that are crooked, that have gone wrong, that have missed the mark, who've betrayed relationships. That when you dig right down and find this broken image bearing within ourselves, you actually find warring desires, right? And what, what we don't need is is our freedom. What we need is a king who will conquer us, the right kind of king who will reorientate us, who will give us a fresh sense of identity, a fresh, sense, a fresh sense of calling and vocation. Because sin is crouching at our door and it longs to destroy us. See, that's the story of Herod's life. Now, I just wonder, just for a second, if it's worth pausing and thinking about what are the things we're investing in? What is our life about? Is it about money? Is it about power? Is it about godless ambition? Where are we, where are we going? What are the mini compromises that we are making? I'm sure Herod didn't start out in life, you know, when I grow up, I'm going to throw a banquet and we're going to behead people. You know, that's so terrible. But he took step after step after step. Can you see Herod's reflection at all when you look in the mirror? I, I can't. I can't. I need rescue. I need forgiveness. I need a new king, a new calling. I can. 
See, from there we go from this awful banquet to another banquet. And uh, we get a glimpse of the host of the banquet in verse 13 and 14. It says, When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. The word solitary place is the Greek word eremos, which means wilderness place, right? So you compare this to Macarus, this opulent kind of place. And Jesus, when he hears about the death of his cousin, withdraws to the, the wilderness. And uh, we don't know why he goes there. Perhaps perhaps he was aware that he could be next on the list. I don't think Jesus was afraid, but maybe there was a sense that his hour had not yet come. Or perhaps he simply needed to go and grieve the loss of his cousin to find some space. And the wilderness was often the place where you went when you needed to meet with God, Right? But hearing this, the crowds follow him on foot from the towns, right? Can you imagine if a bunch of Galilean peasants broke into Herod's feast? What would happen? The soldiers would be caught in and they're crushed, right? But here you have all these, these crowds who follow Jesus, the king, and crash his solitary place, his resting place. And it says that when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, that he had compassion on them. One of my favorite words in the Bible, splenchnizomoi in Greek. You know, the seat of the emotions in, in our culture is the heart. I love you with my heart, I might say. But in the Hebrew culture, it was your innards. It was your guts. It doesn't work quite as well on Valentine's card, does it? I love you with my, my, my bowels, <laughs> you know. But that's, when you, that's where you feel it, right? When you really feel something strongly, you don't feel it here. You often feel it here. And here we have the true king, the true host. And when he sees a crowd in need, it says he had compassion on them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them. And he healed their sick. The word therapuo, it's um, to serve, to cure. So this crowd comes, he has compassion on them, He's, and Jesus starts to serve them, you know, to, to, to cure them. And the word for sick is that sense of being not strong or feeble or sickly. Like this is a very different host, a di very different king. Uh, this was someone who was using his power to, to serve others and not to be served. His life wasn't about prestige. It wasn't about evil desires. Here we have a king who serves and loves the weak. And then we have his banquet. Look with me at verse 15. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place or this is wilderness and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. So the disciples are on the right track, right? Because we see here they've already been touched by the other focusedness of Jesus, right? So they're concerned for the crowds. They just haven't realized how great Jesus is yet. So they want to send everyone back to more inhabited places to find food. But then Jesus says this, he said, they, don't, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. So the disciples start to do an audit. You know, what have we actually got here? Like what, what's actually in our hands? What can we use to meet this need? So they start to count it up. And they said, and when they, when they collected together, about two of them can carry it. It says, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. This is not enough to feed 13, let alone thousands. So Jesus says, well, bring, bring them here to me. Verse 14, bring them here to me, he said. Bring your meager rations. Bring the little that you have to me. And then he takes up uh, this, this incredible little line, it says, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass. 
Now, the Greek word for sit here isn't just, you know, what we're doing tonight. We're like sitting on a chair. This is the word for recline. You know, the banquet word? So you recline, it was the Roman, it was the Greek, it was the Jewish. When you're sitting down to have a formal feast, you had a special way of sitting. You reclined. So here they are in the wilderness, uh, and Jesus is saying, assume the position of the banqueter. <laughs> assume the position of the feast. And then he takes on the role of head of the feast. And he probably prays a prayer like this. He takes bread and says something probably like this. Blessed are you, Lord, our King, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And then he takes the five loaves and the two fish uh, looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. So he's breaking apart the loaves. And then he gave them to the disciples um, and they gave them to the people. Right? So Herod sent his attendants off to do this awful thing of collecting a head, right? Jesus does this beautiful thing of, this, of getting his disciples involved in distributing bread that he's broken and blessed. He takes the meager things they have. He doesn't steal it from anyone else. He asks for it, takes their meager offerings. He blesses it, and then he begins to pass it out through his disciples. Through his disciples. What a beautiful picture of leadership. Now, I can't imagine, as I said, what the day after Herod's feast would have been like. But when this this group of thousands of people who were reclining in the wilderness, when they eat, it said in verse 20, they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. So this very simple feast in the wilderness, they ate. And they were satisfied. James Edwards, who's a, a commentator, says this, This miracle brings the divine will to perfect expression. For God wills to fill his creatures with himself, to meet their needs with his surplus, to expand their smallness with his greatness, and transform mundane life into abundant life. See, it looks like poverty, doesn't it? But here in the wilderness, we see, we see true wealth. See, there's all kinds of things going on in the, this passage. And the first thing this passage is about is, is about identity. See, our mission is to live for a king and serve the purposes of his kingdom. And in the wilderness... A king is being revealed. So just think about it for a second. Bread in the wilderness. Who gives bread in the wilderness? In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 5, Israel's greatest leader, Moses, a shepherd leader, said there will be one that comes that's greater than me. You know, in Jesus' day, the expectation of the prophet that was to come was at fever pitch. Actually, when he performs this miracle, John's gospel says in John chapter 6 that they came and said, this is the prophet, and they wanted to take and make him king by force. This wasn't just a prophet. This was a king, right? And as you read on in the story, you find out that this bread that's distributed by the disciples in this story becomes even more significant because there at a Passover feast in the upper room in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus takes bread and he breaks it and talks about, this is my body broken for you. And they take and eat. They're celebrating this meal of freedom from oppression for the forgiveness of sins. In the very next chapter, we find out what this broken bread is. Is this King Jesus is taken and dressed in a scarlet robe. He's beaten 
they take some thorns and make it into a crown and they press it into his skull. And then they put him on a Roman cross and they lift him up. They enthrone him. And they even make a sign. Kind of, they want to mock him, but they make a sign that says, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. They even make, put it in different languages so they can insult him in every language. Little did they know that they were glorifying the king who is dying for the sins of the world and proclaiming it in all the languages of the people around the cross that day. See, this is the king that's revealed in the desert. And the bread that the disciples are handed out, as we read forward in the Bible story, we find out that this is about, this is Matthew 28, this is being sent out into the world. So it's our job to go out and to proclaim to the world the bread that was broken for us, the, the king that was crucified in our place. We're to go out and share in, in word. We're to share the good news of the gospel who loved the God who loved us and gave himself for us. That's the honour we have in mission. Like, let's not live for small ambitions, for selfish ambitions, but to live for this king who's of such a different character, who's revealed in, in such beautiful ways. What a, what a host. Let's live for him. So we share the bread of the crucified Christ with all that will listen. But it also means we share, we share bread, right? We, we, we carry on a mission of mercy. As we proclaim the gospel, we, we, we are merciful and kind and we do it with the Saviour's compassion. Our mission is so needed in the world right now. You know, just uh, four years ago, I got to travel to Papua New Guinea, to the, the Baya River uh, Valley. Uh, and it's a place of deep significance for Baptist. Um, uh, I, I got to travel. We, we, there'd been some tribal violence, so we actually had a police escort. And uh, we were driving along, and I've never had a police escort. You know, the, the police had machine guns and all kinds of stuff, and I was a little bit nervous. And we pulled over to the side of the road and uh, we stopped at this point where you look down into the Bar River Valley. And uh, we got out of the car. I didn't really know what was happening. And then they, they explained to us, this was the point where the two chiefs, the two Anger chiefs from the Bar River Valley uh, met the first two missionaries uh, to welcome them and then to walk them down into the the villages to start to proclaim the gospel. They, they wanted missionaries to come. And it was really interesting because it's very common for just, uh, there's no displays of affection between uh, men and women, but women and women can hold hands and men and men just as friends hold hands. And I remember I was looking down this valley, extraordinarily beautiful, and I, and I felt someone take my hand and I looked across and there was this big Papua New Guinean policeman with my hand in his hand and in the other hand, he had an Uzi. <laughs> I'll never forget it. But then we went down into the valley. And as we went down into the valley, like old women, oh, this sounds like exaggeration, right? They were just coming up to me and falling into my arms and crying. Because they said, you are the grandchildren of the people who brought us King Jesus. Right? You were... And I said, no, no, I'm not actually the grandchild. And then I realized they think in tribal, like I'm a Baptist. I belong to the tribe, right? And so I was getting, you know, this incredible gratitude on behalf of all of us, really, for bringing the message of Jesus to this valley. And, you know, what followed for the next two weeks was visiting all these incredible little churches sprinkled through that part of the world. All the pastors worked for free. You know, the, the source of income they had was a little bakery called the Five Loaves, right? And they sold these buns and that paid for the pastor's food. But also in this village, as they preached the gospel, it was all these, there's also a hospital called the Tinsley Hospital. I don't know if you know about this, but COVID kind of uh, got to Papua New Guinea a few weeks ago. And uh, as Baptist World Aid, one of our things is COVID response. And we ran an appeal and we were expecting uh, to get maybe $80,000 because what had happened is they just had become overwhelmed by COVID. So 
everyone who worked at the hospital, they were just kind of going to give up and go back to their village. And it was kind of going to be every person for themselves. But we kind of did this appeal, and Baptists across Australia gave $620,000, Brian. And, and it literally meant PPE gear. Uh, it meant um, oxygen. It meant hand sanitizer. And it meant the hospital remained open. And it's open today, treating people, pastors visit and share the gospel. Uh, all sorts of extraordinary things. I wish I could take you there with me. But, um, but what's extraordinary about that is like in Thornley Baptist Church, uh, is this, you, you go there, there's this old bent over man and his beautiful wife, Arthur and Jean Kelshaw. And Arthur Kelshaw built that hospital with Papua New Guineans. Like they built it together with their own hands. And Jean followed him into tribal Papua New Guinea um, to serve King Jesus, right? In very practical ways. Arthur would tell you he's not a preacher. But I once, I once had the privilege of sitting down with Arthur and Jean. Jean turned 100 this year and just saying, well, how did you end up in Papua New Guinea? And they said, well, at the end of World War II, uh, this, this Baptist chaplain called Harry Orr went around the state of New South Wales preaching about the need to take the gospel to Papua New Guinea. So he wore his military uniform and uh, he went to any Baptist church who would have him and preached up a storm and he wanted to raise up a whole team to go. And Arthur and Jean attended one of these meetings and uh, they were engaged, right? So they, they, sit, they didn't sit together in church that night, but Harry Orr apparently preached up a storm and asked for a response at the end of the night. Who will give themselves in service of the king? Whatever skills they have, whatever abilities they have, whatever little they have, who will give it to the king and be used for his glory? And Arthur just said, he stood up, like he was almost pushed up. He said, I, I just knew that it was God calling me to serve him. And then I thought, oh no, I'm engaged. <laughs> what's my, what's my fiancé going to think? And then he turned around and the only other one who was standing up in the room was, was Jean. And they went up into Papua New Guinea and served the king. They served the king of compassion in Papua New Guinea. And now there's a, not a perfect church, but a flourishing and growing church who love Jesus and share his kingdom. So what will it be for you? Will it be Herod's ambition, or will it be Jesus and his mission? Don't, don't waste your life serving cruel and capricious masters who only lead us to disaster. Serve the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and his name is Jesus. Let me pray. Father, we thank you that you are who you are. You are better than we ever could have dreamed, more gracious, more powerful, more holy. We give thanks that we can give our meager lives to you and you take and bless and use us. In Jesus' name, amen.